Worcester State University presents the Presidential Lecture of Ocean Soul by Brian Skerry, National Geographic Underwater Photographer and Worcester State University Class of 1984 in the Fuller Theater on September 20th, 2012. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Worcester State University Presidential Lecture. My name is Tom McNamara, Vice President of University Advancement here at Worcester State. The university community is delighted to be starting this lecture series during the week of the inauguration of the 11th president of Worcester State, Barry M. Maloney, who I'm honored to have here with us this afternoon. I believe Barry is also in the back. Thank you, President Maloney. At this time, I'd like to thank our generous sponsor of this presidential lecture, Sovereign Bank. Sovereign Bank sponsorship is helping not only to underwrite the cost of this year's lecture, but we are pleased to announce that they will be our lead presidential lecture sponsor for the next three years. Thank you. Uh, as a proud graduate of Worcester State, a member of the class of 1994, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you another alumnus, Brian Scurry, who is today's distinguished speaker. Since graduating from Worcester State in 1984 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Media and Communications, Brian has gone on to be an award-winning photographer. Brian's specialty is marine wildlife and underwater photography. Since 1998, he has been a contract photographer for National Geographic magazine, covering a wide range of subjects and stories. His uniquely creative images tell stories not, that not only celebrate the mystery and beauty of the sea, but also help bring attention to the large number of issues that endanger our oceans and its inhabitants. In addition to his 19 published National Geographic stories, Brian has written five books, including Successful Underwater Photography, co-authored with Howard Hall, and most recently, Ocean Soul. His work has also been featured on in a number of magazines, and he has appeared in several television programs. Brian is founding fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers and an explorer in residence at the New England Aquarium in Boston. <coughs> Brian is a Central Massachusetts native and currently lives with his family in Uxbridge. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Brian Skerritt. Thank you all very much. Everyone ready to go for a swim? Yes. You know that's part of the deal, right? That um, after the lecture we're all going to do a little dive in Lake Hill. <laughs> well, it is such a thrill to be back here at Worcester State University, and especially to be here for this wonderful and historic event, the inauguration of President Barry Maloney. Truly honored to be part of this week's ceremonies. Quite a bit has changed as I walk around Worcester State since I was here and a student in the 1980s, um, quite a bit has changed in the world. As I was thinking about it driving up here today, you know, I wonder how we made it through those days as a student without smartphones and iPads and even the internet, but I guess somehow we did. What hasn't changed though is that at its simplest level, being a college student is all about dreams. We come to a school like Worcester State as one of the first steps we take as a young adult in hopes of gaining the knowledge we'll need to make those dreams a reality. When I was here, my dream was to become a National Geographic magazine photographer. It was a pretty lofty goal for a kid from a working class blue collar town in Massachusetts. But as I write in my new book, Ocean Soul, energized with the optimism of youth, I slowly developed a plan. That plan was to learn the fundamentals of photography and other things here in college, and then apply those skills to the underwater world, the field that I wanted to pursue. When I think back on those days, I remember the feeling of opportunity that I had here at Worcester State. I was given not only the knowledge and skills to pursue a career, but I was given the support and the confidence to know that I could accomplish anything that I wanted to. Today, I've been working as a National Geographic magazine photographer for 15 years. 
who just a couple of weeks ago began my 21st feature story. So dreams really do come true, but they need to be encouraged and helped along. And when I think about my own dreams, I think about how important it was to begin that journey here at Worcester State. With the inauguration of President Maloney, we enter into a new era of opportunity, one that I have no doubt will yield countless stories of great success with students in the years to come. So, now it's time for that swim. <laughs> uh, what I'd actually like to share with you this afternoon is or are some of my experiences in the sea through my work as a photojournalist. As I mentioned, I've been working for National Geographic for about 15 years. I've been exploring the ocean for about 35 and making pictures. And the program that I prepared for today is to sort of show you a little bit about my inspiration, how I approach photography, the things I think about before going out on assignment, and then introducing you to the fascinating cast of characters and the wild places I've been around the world, taking you with me on assignment and into the sea. We'll also take a look at some of the problems. As Tom mentioned, some of the work that I do these days, a lot of the work that I do these days is focused on some of the environmental problems. You know, when I first became a photographer, I suppose like most photographers, I just wanted to make beautiful pictures of the places or animals that interested me in the ocean. But there was this evolution. As I began to explore further in the ocean, I saw more and more degradation occurring, things that perhaps weren't evident to most people. And I felt that as a journalist, it was incumbent upon me to begin telling those stories as well. So we'll look at some of the problems uh, from endangered species to habitat loss, but we'll also look at some of the hope, things that are happening in the ocean today that give me reason to be hopeful. Um, so with that, we can have a look at Ocean Soul. Whenever I have a captive audience, I like to begin with a picture of myself as a child. <laughs> this is um, actually where it sort of all began for me in my parents' backyard swimming pool in Uxbridge, Massachusetts, when I was about five years old, dreaming about being an ocean explorer. And um, incidentally, when we scanned this whole photo, I think something happened. Uh, the date at the bottom is a should say August 87. Uh, I was a prodigy when I was here at Worcester State. Um, but, um, you know, it was around this time in my life, though, that I was inspired to be an ocean explorer. I was watching Jacques Cousteau documentaries and reading National Geographic. But as I prepared this program for today, it occurred to me that other things inspired me as well. Things like comic books, for example. I remember looking at Aquaman and thinking, wow, that would be a pretty cool job, you know? Traveling around the planet, riding on the backs of giant seahorses, saving the world. Seemed like a good job. So maybe uh, either consciously or subconsciously, I just wanted to be a superhero or have a job where I could at least dress like one. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is me up off of Cape Breton, Nova Scotia <clears throat> in my snazzy camouflage wetsuit thinking I was going to sneak up on a leatherback sea turtle, which I can tell you was not a good idea, but anyway. Well, being a, a National Geographic photographer, of course, is all about exploration and storytelling, which for me is what Ocean Soul is about as well. It's been described as a love story, if you read the, the dust jacket back cover, it says it's about a love story about a young boy who fell in love with the sea as a child, and I think that's true. You know, from the very first dives that I made as a teenager, I fell in love with not only the sea, but with exploration and discovery of life within the sea. Earth's oceans still remain largely unexplored, so for a photographer and a journalist, it really is the perfect place to work because you never know what you'll find on any given foray into the ocean. I was being interviewed recently by a reporter for a, a photo magazine, and one of the questions the interviewer asked me was, what did I think the most important photograph ever made since the history of photography began was? Well, there was a temptation, of course, to pick one of my own, but what I said was this, the photo that first showed us Earth from space. And I'm certain I'm not the first person to say this, but it bears repeating because when we first saw these pictures in the 1960s, it showed us how beautiful our planet was, how fragile it is, sort of lonely out there in the space, but we could also readily see, clearly see, that we very much live on a water planet. It's often been said that about three quarters, about 75% of the Earth's surface is ocean, which is true, but I think an even more important statistic is that 98%, 98% of the biosphere, the livable, habitable planet where animals can live, is ocean. So, Ocean Soul, then, 
is really about exploring this watery planet photographically. It's a personal journey about peeling back the layers of mystery that exist with animals and ecosystems in the sea and trying to make sense of, of this oceanic puzzle, very little of which has actually been explored. And by the way, is it just me, or does anyone else think the fish on the cover of this book looks like J. Edgar Hoover? <laughs> Don't you think? Just a little? <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> so, as I was saying, Ocean Soul is about exploring the oceans and peeling back the layers of mystery that are, surround so much of what we see in the ocean. You know, during the course of my career, I've been very fortunate to work with many great marine biologists and scientists in the ocean, and I've learned a lot from them. This is a photo I made of one of my colleagues, Enrique Sala, from National Geographic, hovering over a newly discovered species of coral that we found on an expedition to the central South Pacific, a place called Kingman Reef, about 1,200 miles south of Honolulu. And, you know, it still blows me away that we can go to places in the ocean in relatively shallow water, this was about 50 or 60 feet deep, and still find new species. They're waiting to be discovered. Um, it's pretty interesting. For many scientists these days, the big thing in terms of trying to figure out what's happening and to try to make sense of what's going on in the ocean is to <clears throat> capture animals and tag them with tags that they can then track. And I did a story for the magazine a few years ago where I lived on the bottom of the ocean. I lived in what's known as saturation for seven days. I became an aquanaut off of Key Largo, Florida. And the science mission on this project was all about doing that, capturing fish and tagging them. And the way this was done was they would capture fish in these little fish traps and then they would anesthetize them, as we see happening here, and then when the fish was sort of under, they would make an incision and they would insert an electrical acoustic tag that would then give off a signal and they could track the fish movement, kind of like receiving an email from the fish as it swam around the reef. And then they would suture it back up and then they had to revive the fish. So here you see one of the scientists sort of swimming the fish around to get water over its gills to revive it, and then they would let it go and, and wait for those tracking signals, those emails from the fish. And, you know, I, I had to laugh as I was photographing this because I could just imagine, sort of imagine in my mind, uh, this fish the next day out there on the reef swimming with one of his friends saying, no, I'm certain I have a chip in my head. <laughs> you know, they probably form little uh, abductee support groups out there on the, on the reef for these fish that have been abducted. But uh, I like to joke with my, my biologist friends about this, but of course those things do pay great dividends and give great results. But for me, as a photographer, what I've learned is the best way I can approach trying to figure out this oceanic puzzle to make sense of what's going on in the ocean is to just spend time underwater and observe. Now there's a lot of challenges. If there's any divers in the audience, we know that there's challenges of just how long we can stay underwater because of the air supply on our back. We can only stay down there as long as that air supply will last. And even in the most warm conditions on tropical coral reefs like we see here, there are gonna be thermal considerations. We can only stay down until we get cold. You know, you're gonna get cold eventually. And as a photographer, there's lots of obstacles as well. The cameras that we use are regular 35 millimeter cameras, but they go inside an underwater housing, which means I can't change lenses or film, compact flashcards. I'm relegated to whatever I take down with me. And um, I can't use telephoto lenses either. Even in the clearest of water, it's never that clear. So I have to get usually within about five or six feet of my subjects, which is a testimony to the animals. But despite all of those challenges, I know that if I spend time underwater, things will be revealed. So often, when I go on assignment, I find myself in a place I've never been before. And on those initial dives, I really don't know what's going on. You know, it's sort of chaos all around me. I see fish swirling around, and my job is to try to make sense of all that. So what I've learned to do is to just focus on one single scene or one behavior that sort of leads me into this world. It could be something quite simple, like a little blenny, a tiny little fish poking its head out of hard coral here in Belize that was feeding. Or it could be a delicate butterfly fish being cleaned by a little wrasse up in the water column. You know, and inevitably, all of these things are happening all around me, and I just need to zero in on one at a time to begin making order out of chaos. I also look for other things. You know, behaviors are interesting, but the, the images have to be visually compelling as well, so I'm looking for textures and shapes and colors, like this grouping of mushroom corals that were pastel-colored on a faraway reef in the South Pacific that I found one day. You know, in, in Ocean Soul, I write that I believe my most important role remains as artistic interpreter of all that I see. 
I need to understand the science, but what I want to capture is the poetry. So for me, a perfect photograph is one that sort of combines some behavior, some science, along with some artistic elements. It could be a, a school of surgeon fish that are feeding near dusk in the South Pacific, or it could be a single animal like this blue shark that I photographed here in New England. I went into the water this particular day off the coast of Rhode Island wanting to make a picture of a blue shark that showed its absolutely stunning form, that nature has sculpted this thing to be almost like an aircraft with a, a long, slender, fuselage-like body and these pectoral thing, fins that are like the wings of an aircraft. And that particular day, I photographed this animal that had a parasitic copepod, a little parasite attached to its dorsal fin here, adding a, a dash of red color to the otherwise blue backdrop that the animal creates. I did a story for National Geographic recently about the country of Japan where my work was really all about these things, about revealing hidden worlds through photographic discovery. It was a story that I proposed because I wanted to work in three very different ecosystems. I wanted to work in icy realms, I wanted to work in temperate water, and then in tropical waters. And I began my coverage in the north in the northern part of Japan in a place called Hokkaido in the Sea of Okuts near Russia, where in wintertime ice can blanket the coastline sometimes for miles. It's a place that is known for terrestrial wildlife like sea eagles, like the stellar sea eagle that come here from Kamchatka in Russia to feed on herring that aggregate below the ice. And you know, even though I'm an underwater photographer, it's very important for me to make surface pictures as well because most of the readers of National Geographic might not be divers and it helps to lend a, a sense of place, give some context to the story. But getting underwater, of course, is the real reason that I go to these places. And this is a picture I made of my assistant drifting down below these cloud-like ice formations. You know, diving in a place like this is about as alien as you can get without going to another planet. The water temperature is 28.5 degrees Fahrenheit, and the ice above our head is about 25 feet thick. It can be a little dicey sometimes, you know, it's not without risk and trying to find your exit can be tricky because that ice is always moving with wind and tide. But the risks are worth it for me because diving in these polar realms can be stunning. This is a tiny little animal that I went there to photograph in hopes of finding and I did find it's a little animal known as a sea angel. It's only about the size of a tic-tac, if you know what a little tic-tac candy looks like. And this little guy just flies on these diminutive little wings beneath the ice pack. And on the ocean floor, on the benthic region, I found equally bizarre animals, like this fish called the barbed poacher, which reminded me of animals that I'd seen here in New England, like, like sculpin. But it was just a little bit different, a little more exotic, with this long sword-like appendage off its nose. You know, diving in these places where the water is 28 or 29 degrees is a very equipment-intensive business. You have to wear a lot of equipment. This is me exiting the water with my Japanese guide here, Seiki-san. And, you know, I'm wearing a dry suit, which uh, I can wear undergarments underneath, and you put air in to stay warm, and there's heavy boots attached, and I have two hoods on, and even with that, you get pretty cold. And the thing that always gets really cold uh, for me, at least the thing that goes first, is my hands. They get really, really cold. So I've actually added attached gloves, which is a bit of a special piece of diving equipment that allows me to wear mountain climbing glove liners underneath, which are pretty good for keeping my hands warm in the water. They're not so good for eating with chopsticks, though, in, uh, in Japan here, as you see me trying to do. You know, it took so long to get into all this equipment that between dives, I didn't want to get out of it. So I uh, tried eating lunch. I, I could barely master the chop chopsticks without the gloves, and with them, it was a real challenge. And incidentally, I think that was a, a toy balloon that gave me to eat for lunch. I'm not I'm still not sure what it was I was eating. But uh, anyway, so at the opposite end of the spectrum, from the frozen north of Hokkaido, I traveled to a faraway place called the Ogasawara Islands in uh, in Japan. This is a, a location of islands about 600 miles away from Tokyo, out in the middle of the Pacific. And once again. On those initial dives, I found myself trying to make order out of chaos. On some of the first dives, I, I really didn't know what was going on. I saw this school of fish, these silver and, and uh, yellow fish called sea bream, and I noticed in the middle was this little red fish with a big eye called a glass eye that seemed to be hiding out, hoping that I wouldn't blow his cover here. So I just took a picture and kind of moved on. And another day, I found myself on top of an old World War II shipwreck where coral was growing on the engine. It was all rusty and the ship was falling apart, the engine was still intact, and up on top was this coral in which was living this tiny little hermit crab that was occupying the, the, whole, the home of a, 
a Christ Christmas tree worm that used to live there. But this little guy was about half the size of a grain of rice, very, very tiny. And he would only poke his head out for a few seconds and then dart back into that hole. So I sort of straddled the top of the engine and, and swayed in the surge there and every few seconds tried to make a frame or two to get an image that would help tell the story. On another dive, I was taken by my guide inside an underwater cave on this island of Chichijima and shown this grouping of tunicates. They look like little plants, they're actually animals. And I was told that they are endemic to this one cave on this one island in this one part of Japan. They're found nowhere else in the world. Um, but I wanted to get this picture. It was a difficult picture to make. They were living on the, the cave wall, but there was a big boulder just in front of it, so I had to sort of invert my body you know, upside down, have my assistant hold my feet. But I, I wanted to get this picture because they looked to me like they had little Mr. Bill faces, you know? <laughs> it looks like they were saying, oh no. But um, they're not faces, they're just the way nature designed them. So I thought that would be a fun picture to include. And, and, and these were the guys that I actually had gone to the Ogoswara Islands to photograph. Actually, more correctly, these gals. This was a female sand tiger shark. Before I left to go to this part of the world, I was told by some researchers that I could predictably find sand tiger sharks there almost any time of the year that I went. But I spent an entire month on location, and it was only on the very last day that I found the sand tiger sharks. I was diving on a reef at about 60 feet and looked down a little bit deeper to see two pregnant females just sort of cruising along. And even though they looked kind of menacing with all those teeth, they were actually quite polite and let me pretty close to make this portrait of an animal that was probably only a few days away from having her pups. Probably my favorite place to work in Japan was Suruga Bay, a temperate water location. So I was in cold, I was in warm, and now we're sort of in the just right place. And diving here uh, in the shadow of Mount Fuji was like diving through the pages of a storybook. On every dive, I found an interesting cast of characters. On one of my very first dives, I found myself in this sort of dimly lit whip coral forest. It's a coral uh, forest called whip coral, these sort of gnarly cable-like corals that grow from the bottom. It sort of looks like a tin Tim Burton cartoon or Tim Burton movie or something, but I was told by researchers that if I was very diligent and very persistent and I inspected every one of those whip corals, I might find a pair of whip coral shrimp living on them. And sure enough, I did. And here we see the male and female whip coral shrimp who lived their entire lives on a single strand of coral like this. The, the female is actually the larger on the left of the frame, the male uh, on the right of the frame, but you know, when you're making a dive like this, you're going into the water on a sunny day and there's uh, helicopters going by and trains and people hustling, bustling around. And you go down 100 feet or so and you see something like this and it just helps put things in perspective about how majestic and amazing our planet is and animals that live their entire life on a single strand of coral. I also, while exploring Saruga Bay, found a fish eating another fish. This is a lizard fish eating a little wrasse. And you know, you might think if you dive often enough, as often as I, I go diving, you'd see this kind of thing happening a lot. But in reality, I've only seen predation like this a couple of times. And usually, it's very quick. It, it happens so fast, you can't really photograph it. But in this case, I think the little wrasse that was being eaten, I think the dorsal uh, spines in his dorsal fin were probably stuck in the lizard fin, uh, fish's throat and made swallowing a little difficult. So I was able to have a few moments to do some backlighting here and, and, and make this portrait of this predation. Occurring. Now, the smarter fish, the, the fish with a little bit more intelligence in this part of Japan, seek refuge inside abandoned soda cans, like, like this one has right here. Here we see a little yellow goby hiding out inside an old Coke can. And, um, you know, I saw this. I was diving at the bottom of a slope. I had gone down an, uh, an incline underwater at a depth of about 100 feet, and there was some debris down there. And I was swimming past it and caught just a little flash of color. And I kind of got down on my belly and with my elbows kind of inched my way closer. And uh, he sort of just drifted into his doorway here and thought it was like the Cheshire cat was about to speak to me. But I um, was able to make a, a frame and then move on. You know, so often I'm, I'm on assignment in very remote places like this in Japan where there's not a lot of other divers around and I'm sort of out there on my own just trying to make sense of it all. But that's not always the case. I did a story a couple of years ago about manatees and I found myself in Florida, working in the wintertime in freshwater rivers. The manatees, as you may know, are marine mammals. They breathe air, like us, and they spend the warmer months of the year in the ocean, but in the, uh, in 
the winter time, they move into rivers and streams where the springs create warmer water. They need about 72 degrees to stay alive. They need warm water. So they aggregate near the source of these springs. This is an aerial picture that I made from a helicopter showing all these manatees sort of gathered in the roped off area is sort of a, a sanctuary area where you can't go. But if you stay outside and are patient, inevitably one of these animals will come over because they're usually quite curious and will come over and interact with you. And that was a big part of the, the coverage that I wanted to photograph to show that these animals who have lost a lot of their natural habitat due to development in Florida, they've lost a lot of their places like the Everglades and other rivers that they used to live in have sort of had to become urban animals. They've acclimated to humans and they've done it quite well. So that was a big part of what I wanted to photograph. But I still think that my most magical experiences, as is so often the case, happened late in the day when everybody else had gone. You know, I, I sort of observed that these animals would go down a narrow channel around sunset each day and the, the channel opened up into this very primordial looking spring. Nobody else was around, and I was able to sort of just very zen-like drift in there with them with just a mass snorkel and fins in my wetsuit, no scuba. And the light levels were very low. You know, this is something that I might not have been able to do with film years ago. I was shooting at 1600 or 2000 ISO, which allowed me to not only photograph the animal, but to show some of the, the habitat in which they live as well. And you may also know that manatees are the animals that scientists tell us inspired the legend of mermaids. Uh, if you read the log books of early explorers like Columbus, who came over to the New World as they approached what we know as North America now, they reported seeing mermaids. And we know now that it was, in fact, a manatee. It's still kind of hard for me to believe that they could have ever mistaken that face for um, that of a mermaid, but evidently those boys had been on the boat a little too long. Uh, but, you know, as a photographer or somebody who appreciates wildlife, this is a pretty wonderful experience. You know, you're all alone out there, the light levels are sort of diminishing, and these animals are allowing you, or allowing me, into their world. As I mentioned, sort of in my opening comments, we can't use telephoto lenses. You know, my, my terrestrial counterparts at National Geographic can sit in the blind in Africa and use a, a thousand millimeter lens to get a picture of some, some animal, but I have to get very close, which means these animals have to let me into their world, and they do, and, and that's the beauty of it. So, you know, it's it, to me, it's, it's about finding these, these precious moments. You know, before I left to do this assignment, I had read a lot about manatees to do my research, and I had read that they're not particularly social animals in comparison to whales or dolphins, other marine mammals. But, you know, I would see scenes like this at the end of the day where they were sort of rubbing each other and gathering up, and, and you know, these were just a brief glimpse into a, a mysterious world. You know, I, I think that my career has become very addictive. I, I um, have sort of become addicted to having these extraordinary encounters. Um, I spend about eight or nine months a year, each year, uh, over the last 15 years, out in the field, uh, traveling around, doing these assignments, which can get pretty, pretty tiring. And when I come back home to Massachusetts, you know, I'll, I'll lay on the couch and just want to watch Seinfeld reruns or something. But <laughs> after a few days, you know, I'm chomping at the bit to get back out there because I know that if I spend time on the ocean or in the ocean, I will see extraordinary things. But over those years that I've been doing this, I've also begun to see some pretty horrible things as well, things that may not be evident to most people. And as I mentioned earlier, um, as a journalist, I've sort of felt a sense of responsibility and also a sense of urgency to turn my cameras towards these subjects as well, to tell a more complete story of what's happening in the ocean. One of the first big stories that I did for National Geographic, in which I was able to include environmental themes within the context of a broader natural history story, was a piece about harp seals. Now, harp seals are Arctic animals. They spend most of their life living up near the North Pole in the Arctic, but for a few weeks each year, they migrate down to a place called the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada, sort of near Newfoundland. And during those few weeks, in February and March, they engage in courtship, mating, and pupping. If the females have become pregnant the year before, they have their pups. And all of that drama is played out against the backdrop of transient pack ice that's always moving with wind and tide. So the story that I wanted to do was to look at this sort of life cycle, this snapshot, a very dramatic time in their life, their annual life cycle, where all of this stuff was happening. Um, and 
I had seen some work that other photographers had done on the surface of harp sails, and I learned that they had done it by using helicopters to go out onto the ice pack, but they could only stay out for a few hours each day. They had to be back before sunset. So I had the idea to charter a, a 65 foot steel hulled crab fishing boat that we used like an icebreaker, and we could break through the ice and live with the seal herd for weeks at a time, and I could become fully immersed in, in harp seal world out there and capture things that I might not otherwise have been able to see, you know, interesting behaviors like the harp seal kiss, something I had read about but hadn't really seen photos of. This is a behavior where the mother will sniff her pup each time before each feeding to make sure she's feeding only her pup. And, you know, th these animals are animals that have the second fastest weaning in the animal kingdom. They, the pups go from being born completely helpless to being completely on their own 14 days later. During that time, they nurse from their moms and they become very chubby. Like we see this one here, they, they get to be known as a fat white coat. And it's about that time in their life when they begin to take to the water and test out those flippers and try to learn how to swim. All seals, all pinnipeds are great swimmers, but when they first get in the water, they're not quite sure what to do. And they also have some air trapped in their coats, um, so they sort of bob up and down like a cork, which allowed me an opportunity to make some, some images. But pretty quickly, they, they catch on and they begin to swim. And you know, these were photographs that had never been made before. And this is a, a harp seal pup making its very first swim under that ice shelf while mom sort of proudly watches from behind, kind of like watching your kid ride its bike for the first time, maybe. Um, and you know, and as I was doing the story, this is initially what I thought the story should be about. But as we got more involved in it, two big environmental issues became apparent that we couldn't ignore if we were going to tell a complete story. The first was that these animals continued, and still to this day, continue to be hunted. It's actually the, the largest mass slaughter of marine mammals on the planet. Hundreds of thousands of seal pups are killed every year with these hackapecs, these clubs, um, just for their pelts. They're not, they don't consume the meat. Uh, it's just to make hats and mittens and coats. And um, I didn't know if I could photograph this. The, the hunters had sort of uh, formed a pack and said they wouldn't allow journalists uh, out there to, to photograph this stuff. But I actually became the first journalist in 17 years to get aboard one of these hunting boats. And I was given some restrictions as to what, I, what I could photograph. But here you see one of the hunters dragging back one of the seals that he's killed. But as troubling as this is, and it is disturbing, I think the greater threat going forward for these animals will be the loss of sea ice due to climate change. This is a photograph that I made from a helicopter uh, looking at the Gulf of St. Lawrence during harp seal season, and we see a lot of ice, but we also see a lot of water in this photograph, and the ice that does remain is quite thin. And the problem is that these pups need a stable platform in order to nurse from their moms. They only need 14 days, as I mentioned. But if the ice is too thin or non-existent, they will fall into the water ahead of schedule before they're prepared, and they can die because they're not ready. And this is a photograph that shows that very thing happening, where a pup that was maybe only five or six days old, still had a piece of the umbilical cord on its belly, that red piece there, uh, had fallen through this very thin, slushy ice, and the mother was frantically trying to push it back up to breathe and to get back to stable purchase. Now, the time that I spent up there, I saw a number of seals that did die, and I saw a number of seals that made it, like this one. But um, as years have gone on, I did that story almost 10 years ago, and um, it's gotten worse and worse. In the last couple of years, the ice has been non-existent, and the pup mortality rate has increased to 100%. So in future years, there'll be no new age class for these animals, and, and I think those are the kinds of problems and challenges that this species will have to sort of deal with if, if they're going to survive long term. This actually became a cover story in 2004 at National Geographic, and with that, it received quite a bit of attention. Um, and I saw the opportunity to begin doing other stories about environmental issues in the ocean as well. Sort of on the heels of the harp sales story, I proposed a story about something called the global fish crisis. It's uh, the, the problems of overfishing in the world due to commercial industrialized overfishing. And this came about really for two reasons. One, because I had personally seen less fish in so many of the places I used to see many fish, but I also read a scientific paper in the British journal Nature. It was published by two Canadian scientists that stated that 90% of the big fish in the ocean have disappeared in the last 60 years post-World War II because of overfishing. Think about that. 90% of the tuna, the billfish, and the sharks have just been wiped out in our planet. And when I read that, 
I thought that this was going to be headline news in every media outlet, but it really wasn't. So I decided to propose the story, which National Geographic embraced, and it became a, a cover story as well. And we spent about two years working on this story. And what I wanted this story to be was very different than a traditional, pretty underwater story. I wanted it to be more like war photography. I wanted to show readers the things that were happening to wildlife around our planet. You know, this is harvesting wildlife. It's not like cows and chickens. But one of the essential foundations for this story that I believed was essential was what I called wildlife appreciation. I wanted readers to have some sense of the animals that we're consuming out there. You know, I think when we go to a restaurant and, and somebody orders a steak, we know where a steak comes from, and somebody else orders chicken, we know what a chicken is. But when you're eating bluefin tuna sushi, I wondered how many people had any concept of the magnificent animal that they were consuming. This is a school of bluefin that I photographed in the Mediterranean off of Spain. These are animals that have no terrestrial counterpart. There's nothing like them on the planet. They continue to grow their entire life. If we weren't so efficient at catching them, there'd be 30-year-old bluefin out there that weigh a ton. But they don't get anywhere near that big these days. These are animals that can generate heat. They're effectively warm-blooded fish. And because of that, they can swim practically from the equator to the poles in search of prey. These are animals that were revered by cavemen. Cavemen painted pictures on their cave walls, and even early philosophers like Plato wrote about them and mused about their wanderings. And yet today, these animals are on the verge of extinction because of our lust for sushi. You know, this is a picture I, I was given special permission to photograph the Skiji fish market in Tokyo. And this is a, a, a tuna auction where bluefin and yellowfin tuna are auctioned off every single day, 365 days a year, every year for the last 20 or 30 years. And as I wandered around this place and, and, and saw these tuna that were stacked up like cordwood, it sort of occurred to me that the ocean is in a grocery store. We can't continue to take at unsustainable levels and expect everything to be okay. There will be serious consequences as a result. One of the other things that I wanted to do with this story was to show readers how fish are caught. Because again, I don't think most folks ever think about this. It's just another agriculture, you know, another thing that we, we eat. But it's very, very different. This is the most common method of fishing in the world. It's something called a, a trawl net, a bottom trawl. And the way it works, this was a small one that I photographed in Mexico that was being used to catch shrimp. But the principle is the same on a much grander scale everywhere in the world. And the way it works is you've got a net, and at the end of each, uh, each side of the net, you've got two big steel doors. And there's buoys on the top of the net and a lead-weighted line on the bottom. And as this whole assembly is towed behind a boat, the doors sort of meet resistance with the water, and it opens the mouth of the net. And as you can imagine, it's very effective at catching the intended target, whatever that might be. In this case, shrimp just bounce into that net. But as you can also imagine, it's quite effective at catching everything else in its path as well. And because this was a bottom trawler, it was being dragged over the bottom, which was destroying that precious benthic layer, the, the home of corals and anemones and all these little juvenile animals that have no commercial value but will be caught in the process. This was a photograph I made of the fisherman's hands after he towed that net for one hour. After one hour, he had a handful of shrimp, seven or eight shrimp. But all those other animals that are dead on the deck of his boat are called bycatch. They're unintended catch that have no commercial value and will be thrown back into the sea as trash. So this is the true cost of a shrimp dinner. Seven or eight shrimp and maybe 10 pounds of other animals that die in the process. And to make that point even more visual, I swam under the boat and photographed as they were shoveling that bycatch back into the sea. This cascade of death, animals like guitarfish, back rays, baby flounder, that only an hour before were alive on the bottom of the sea. 60 billion pounds a year of bycatch is thrown back into the sea as trash. And I also wanted, with this story, to spend some time on the shark fishery. Because right now, on planet Earth, we are killing, in excess, of 100 million sharks every single year. 100 million sharks. We can't expect to kill 100 million apex predators in any ecosystem and expect it to remain healthy. And that's why the oceans are in trouble. Often they're caught just for their fins, as we see this mako shark being finned right here for the soup fin trade in, in Asia. But as I went out to photograph this component of the story, you know, I sort of wrestled with how I would make a photograph of a dead shark that would resonate with readers. There's still a belief that sharks are dangerous or there's something to be killed. The only good shark is a dead shark. So I photographed a number of images that technically were good and would have worked for the story, but it was one morning when I jumped in 
and, and found this thresher shark that had just recently died in a gill net that I felt we had what we needed. This is an animal that lives in, in the open ocean. It's a pelagic animal, like the blue shark that I showed you earlier, and it has these great big pectoral fins, and its eye was still open because it had only recently died. And as I began to compose the image in the viewfinder of my camera, it sort of struck me as a crucifixion. And I thought that you know maybe this would give some empathy to that issue of 100 million sharks being killed each year on our planet. It actually became the lead photograph in the cover story in 2007. But it's lived on. It's had a life beyond National Geographic. It's been used by conservation groups. And last year, I received a call from the president of Chile who wanted to use it in a PowerPoint presentation to his government. And then later last year, the country of Chile banned shark finning. So, you know, these images can make a difference. They can resonate with people. We're visual creatures, and, and this is what we need to sort of move that agenda forward. Around that same time, I did another story about sharks, a more celebratory piece, because I love sharks, I love photographing them, but I wanted it to be a celebratory story, happy pictures of sharks, but use it as a way of, of talking about the need for shark conservation. But as I looked at the globe and tried to determine where it was I would go to make my photographs, it occurred to me that there wasn't many places left on the globe where sharks were doing well. I settled on the Bahamas because the Bahamas was a country that was very progressive, actually. They had passed laws, they had outlawed lawn mining, one of the predominant ways sharks are caught, and they recently passed legislation to prevent any shark from being killed or the export of any shark parts. So they've been very progressive, and because of that, shark populations are doing better there. And I wanted to work with a number of species that I had never been able to photograph before, and we had never really featured in the magazine. Animals like the tiger shark that we see here, an animal that's considered the most dangerous shark in tropical waters, the second most dangerous after the great white worldwide, an animal that's been portrayed as a monster, but isn't anything like that. I just wanted to show it as one very important part of whatever ecosystem it happens to inhabit. This particular day, I was able to make this portrait of, of a beautiful 12-foot-long female tiger shark that had three little bar jacks, these silver fish swimming off her nose, and they created a little shadow on her face, like a little fish tattoo. And uh, on another trip, I went in search of the great hammerhead, an animal that as recently as maybe 10 years ago, there were no photographs of, but a buddy of mine who lives in Florida discovered a place in the wintertime where we could find these animals, but the weather was always a challenge. So in 18 days, I only had two days where the weather was good enough to work, but on the very last day, this beautiful 14-foot male great hammerhead came swirling in just below the uh, surface at sunset, and I was able to make this picture. But these are animals that we know almost nothing about. We don't know where they migrate to or from, where they mate, where they have their pups, and yet hammerhead populations in the Atlantic Ocean have declined 89% in the last 20 or 30 years. We're losing them faster than we can learn about them. And the last, one of the last species that I worked with on this story was the oceanic white tip, an animal that's considered the fourth most dangerous species of shark, if you pay attention to such lists, but it's an animal that's about 98% in decline throughout most of its range. It's on the verge of extinction. They were once commonly seen in the Bahamas, but at the time I was working on this story, nobody had really seen one in 20 or 30 years, no divers. But I got a report from some sport fishermen down at a place called Cat Island in the central Bahamas who said they were catching yellowfin tuna on rod and reel. And as they were reeling in the tuna, they said oceanic white tips were stealing them off the line. So sort of based on that fish tail, I charted my friend's boat and we went out for 16 days. And because we weren't going to be working on the bottom, I brought along a shark cage because I didn't know, you know how dangerous these animals might be. And at 16 days, we only had one encounter, but it was a beautiful female oceanic white tip that came in late one afternoon and with me was my friend Wes Pratt, a, a shark biologist who works at Moat Marine Lab in, in Florida. And as you can see from this picture, the biologist was smarter than the photographer because he was inside the cage and I wasn't. <laughs> but um, the truth is, as with the other sharks that I've shown you today, uh, she was quite polite as well and just settled into doing these big lazy circles around me for about two hours and, until the light levels began to drop and I had to pull the anchor and go home. And with this story, I also wanted to show readers baby sharks, because this was something that I hadn't really seen a lot of, but it's a very important part of the story. So I went to the island of Bimini in the northern Bahamas, just off Miami, Florida. And I spent about two weeks working with baby lemon sharks here. And these animals spend the first two to three years of their lives living in mangrove nurseries. Now, mangroves are places in the ocean where trees grow out of the water, and it's very shallow, 
So it creates a, a natural nursery for juvenile animals, for baby animals, because big predators can't get in there. But to make these pictures, I just went out, this is a picture of me that my assistant took, and I just would lay in these very shallow water mangrove swamps with just my wetsuit and mask and snorkel. It was probably 110 degrees, very hot in the summertime, lots of mosquitoes, a lot of buggy environment here. But after doing this for a while, the sharks built up their curiosity about me. At first they were a little spooked, but they eventually came in and I was able to make pictures like this that shows this baby shark that was only maybe 12 inches in length swimming in about a foot deep of water. You know, a very different kind of shark picture, but one that's very important for the story. I actually learned after I left Bimini at this time that this part of this mangrove had been bulldozed so that a golf course could be built by a resort. Very sad story. But um, fortunately, some of the mangrove still remains and it's in the efforts now of trying to be protected. So hopefully that'll happen. I also wanted to share with you this afternoon a couple of stories about single species, charismatic megafauna, if you will. Animals like the leatherback sea turtle, the largest of all sea turtle species. It's actually the largest, the deepest diving, and the widest ranging of all sea turtles in the world. This is an animal whose lineage dates back a hundred million years. They're actually older than dinosaurs. There was a time when they were crawling out of the water to nest like this female is doing here. And they saw Tyrannosaurus rex running by. And today, in some places, they crawl out and see condominiums. So they've been through an awful lot. But they, too, are on the brink these days because of so many problems that are occurring in the ocean. I began my coverage on the island of Trinidad in the Caribbean, one of the largest nesting beaches for leatherbacks in the world. And I didn't want to use a white flash, you know, photographer's flash, um, at night because white light can disturb nesting turtles. So I timed my coverage to occur and coincide with a full moon. So pictures like this were made on a very long exposure under a full moon, which actually allowed me to see some of the habitat as well. On the nights when there was no full moon, I switched to doing infrared photography, which meant I had red lights, a studio set up on the beach, but the red light the turtle didn't see, so it wasn't um, disturbing to the turtle. But it renders the picture black and white, which was okay. And here we see some conservation workers that are weighing one of these nesting turtles. The turtle sort of goes into a trance when she's nesting. It's about a two hour process. And toward the end, they're able to excavate a little tunnel underneath her and put this sling and they erect a tripod and a block and tackle and they weigh her and do some science. And this particular turtle weighed in at 1,089 pounds. Just a giant animal like lifting up a Volkswagen here. But this is how they start their life. It's just a tiny little hatchling scrambling to the ocean, about to taste salt water for the very first time. Scientists tell us that only about one in a thousand leatherback hatchlings will actually reach sexual maturity, that they'll actually become an adult. And that's due to natural predation, things like vultures that pick them off on the beaches, they're making that mad dash for the ocean, and predatory fish that are waiting to gobble them up offshore. But nature has learned to compensate for this. They've learned to adjust for that, and have, the females have multiple clutches of eggs, and hundreds of, of babies, so they've overcome that off, those odds. What they can't overcome are the anthropogenic stresses, the problems that occur because of us. Things like getting caught in gillnets, like we see this one here. In Trinidad alone, this one tiny island in the Caribbean, over a thousand leatherback turtles are killed every year when they drown in gillnets like this. The fishermen are not trying to catch the turtles, they're trying to catch fish, but Inevitably, they get caught. So I worked with a fisherman. I charted my own little boat, and I sort of tagged along. He would fish at night, and I went alongside of him uh, with his permission, and he strings about a mile long gill net every night. So he could be at one end when a turtle's caught at the other end, and he'll never know it until it's too late. So I would just patrol up and down all night, and finally, sure enough, they got a turtle. So I jumped in. And I made a few frames, and then I handed the camera to my assistant, and I, I cut this turtle out. So this one got away, but so many more did not. And you know, to find a, a turtle in the wild, to actually see a leatherback in the wild, is very, very rare. These are animals that are not interested in interacting with us. To get a picture like this one, I actually went to the Pacific, to a very remote part of Indonesia. I camped on a beach at the edge of a jungle for three weeks. Very remote place. Uh, you know, breakfast every morning was power bar and a malaria pill. Um, and then at night I would, you know, put the mosquito netting around me and pick scorpions out of my uh, out of my sleeping bag and then go out in a little Indonesian longboat every day and just try to free dive to snorkel with these turtles. I only had three encounters 
during my three weeks, but one was this one with this beautiful animal that was about the size of an old-fashioned bathtub, like her own little universe here with remora stuck to her body and escort fish. Very rare thing to see, but very privileged to do so with an animal that's 95% in decline in the Pacific Ocean. And another story that I wanted to share with you about a charismatic megafauna is a story of right whales, the most endangered species of whale on the planet. Essentially, the story of right whales is this, that about a million years ago, there was one species of right whale on our planet. But as land masses moved around and oceans became isolated, they too became isolated. And today we essentially have two distinct populations of right whales. We have the southern right whale that we see here, and we have the North Atlantic right whale that you see here, mom and calf that I photographed from an airplane off of Jacksonville, Florida. Now, both species were hunted to the brink of extinction by the early whalers. In fact, they were named the right whale because they were considered the right whale to kill. They were slow moving and they floated after they were dead. But the southern right whale that we saw in the previous picture has rebounded much better. They're still considered endangered, but because they live further away from human activity in places like Patagonia, South Africa, and Australia, they're removed from those anthropogenic stresses and they've rebounded much better. This animal, the ones we have here in New England, are the most endangered whale on the planet. There are only about 400 of them left. And the reason they're so endangered is because they are urban whales. They live along our coastline and have to contend with all those urban ills. Pollution, things like pharmaceuticals that get flushed out into the watershed, they believe are affecting their reproduction, which is very erratic. They get entangled in fishing gear and die because of that, and they get struck by ships that don't see them on the surface. This was a dead one that I photographed in Nova Scotia, Canada, that was being towed in. Typically, when they find a right whale that's dead, Coast Guard will tow it in so that they can do a necropsy. They can determine the cause of death. And in this case, it was determined that this animal died due to a ship strike. It had been run over by a ship. And it was the worst of all possible scenarios because this was a, a young adult female that would have had more calves. It's been said if we could save two right whales a year, the population would increase, but so far we haven't been able to do that. So to draw a comparison with the beleaguered North Atlantic population, I went to the sub-Antarctic of New Zealand to a new population of southern right whales that had just been discovered. This is me and my assistant on an 82-foot sailboat that I charted in the main island of New Zealand, and we sailed down to the sub-Antarctic in wintertime, kind of a dicey time of year to go down there. And it was a very speculative trip. I didn't know what we would find, if the visibility would be good, if the animals would let me close. It was, a, it was a big roll of the dice. But from the moment I arrived, I was just blown away by how curious these animals were about me. This was on the first day I got in the water, and two of these big, giant whales just swam over to me. And I should also mention that right whales have these white things on their head. They're called callosities. And the right whales are born with rough patches of skin in about the same place that humans have hair. So on top of their head, on their chin, and over their eye, like an eyebrow. And they get occupied by barnacles and little crabs known as cyamids, which give them shape and color. It's how researchers identify individual animals. But, you know, within just a couple of days of, of swimming with these animals, I was able to make full-frame portraits of their eye, this very soulful eye that clearly was looking at me and thinking about me, wondering about me. On the days when the visibility wasn't so good, I would sort of drop down deeper and make silhouette pictures like this of, of courtship. This is a male and a female that was in this beautiful courtship ballet. And I was wearing a dry suit, so I was careful to maintain good buoyancy. I didn't want to drift up in the middle of them. That would have been bad. <laughs> but, um, and then, you know, I, I was diving alone for those first several days because I didn't want anyone else in the water. I was afraid that too many people might spook the animals and I wouldn't be able to make pictures. But after I started to get a few images in the can, as we say, and feel a little comfortable, I, I had the idea of trying to make a photograph of a human with one of these whales to show scale and to see if that would work. So I asked my assistant, Mauricio, to get in the water with me. And you never know if the animal is, is going to cooperate. But we found this one animal up on the surface. We swam down to 70 feet. And lo and behold, this animal, as if on cue, just swam over to us. This is a 45-foot, 70-ton right whale that chose to hang out with us. It spent about two hours with us that day. We actually were able to go up to our zodiac, change tanks, and come back down and spend more time with this animal. You know, I can remember swimming over the bottom, looking through my viewfinder, and I had probably 120 pounds of equipment on, so I'm swimming and shooting and swimming. And eventually, I needed to catch my breath, and I, I just knelt down in the sand, thinking the whale would leave me behind in its wake. 
But the whale actually stopped and turned and came back and, and with that big softball eye looked as if to say, I know you can't swim very well, I'll, I'll wait. Um, <laughs> and then I caught my breath and, and off we went. And incidentally, this is also a good time to give you some insight as to what it's like to work for National Geographic magazine, the expectations. Um, you know, I was very happy when I made this series of pictures, got back on the boat, we eventually sailed back to the mainland of New Zealand. I had to shift gears and repack, and then I flew to Honolulu, Hawaii, where I was getting on another ship for three weeks to do a coral reef expedition. I was in my hotel room, about ready to check out, and I got an email from my editor, Kathy Moran, back in Washington, D.C., and she just wrote sort of cryptically, so Brian, how did you do with the whales? So very proud of myself, you know, I wrote back, well, Kathy, you know, I think we did pretty well. We've got stuff that's never been seen before, and all proud of myself, I attached a JPEG of this, this photograph and sent it off to her in Washington. And I, I sort of needed to check out and leave my room, but I was anxious for that reply that I was sure would be heaping all kinds of praise on me. And I eventually got an email with just five words that said, what else do you have? <laughs> so that's what it's like to work for the geographic. <laughs> Not always so romantic. Um, just two more brief stories that I wanted to share with you this afternoon. The first, about coral reefs, because Today, in 2012, on planet Earth, we have lost 40 to 50 percent of the world's coral reefs. 40 to 50 percent of the world's coral reefs are either completely gone or severely degraded, largely due to climate change, to overfishing, to runoff in, in island nations where they've deforested and things have, have gone wrong. And this is a picture that I made in the Yucatan of Mexico a couple of years ago. I was taken by some folks down there to what they said was one of their better coral reefs. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's severely bleached. There's almost no fish and algae is, is growing everywhere. But this is the way it looks in so many parts of the world, so many parts of the Caribbean and, and parts of the world where you go and dive on coral reefs. To find a truly healthy, pristine, if you will, coral reef, you have to journey to some of the most remote places on the planet. I've done three expeditions for National Geographic in recent years to the central South Pacific, some of the most difficult places on the planet to get to, places like Kingman Reef, which the United States owns. It's about 1,200 miles south of Honolulu to a place called the Phoenix Islands, owned by the country of Kiribati, and the Southern Line Islands, also owned by the country of Kiribati. And in these places, working with a team of scientists, we've discovered that a truly healthy coral reef is the exact opposite of what scientists traditionally thought. Traditionally, scientists believe that a healthy coral reef was comprised mostly of reef fish, little tiny reef fish, and very few predators like sharks. What they've seen, these scientists, by essentially going back in time, going to these unspoiled reefs that were lost in time, they've determined that a truly healthy coral reef has a biomass that is comprised of 85% predators like sharks, and snapper, and the rest is reef fish. And the way it works is like the gears of a clock or a watch. You know, the predators are very slow-moving metabolisms and, and, and very slow reproduction, where the little baby, uh, the small fish, the reef fish, are turning very fast, and they're spawning every few days and, and you know, um, turning out lots of babies, and, and, and it all works. It's a very well, delicate, balanced machine. Um, what I saw in these places was as a photographer, it, it had created sort of a landscape of fear. You know, so many of the animals that y you normally associate with a healthy coral reef, big schools of fish we weren't seeing. The fish were there, they were just hiding. It's like when they reintroduced the wolves to Yellowstone, you know, the, the deer was still there, but you didn't see them, they were just better at hiding. Um, what I also saw is that every animal played a, a vital role. Every animal had a function. Animals like herbivores, like parrotfish that graze on the algae on corals to prevent the algae from choking the coral like we saw in that dead reef earlier. Animals like planktivores, you know, in some places we did find schools of fish where there were oceanic upwellings, these currents that brought up nutrients and plankton from the bottom, and these animals like surgeon fish and soldier fish would mill about in the current and, and sort of feed. I often like to work on coral reefs around dusk, around sunset, because it's that time when the light levels get low that I can really get the true colors. I can slow everything down and see movement and, and, and saturate the colors. During the bright sunny day in a tropical reef, I, I have no control over the light, but at dusk I can slow things down. This was a pair of purple goatfish that was about to spawn. They were down in the coral just getting ready to go up and, and do their spawning dance. Moments after I made this picture, they went up into the darkness and, and did that. And on another evening about dusk in a place called Millennium Atoll, I found this very unique pair of 
of unicorn fish, animals I had never seen before, that were swimming along the deep drop off at the edge of the reef. And I sort of stalked them for a very long time, wanting to get close enough to make a, a picture, but not so close to disturb them, and was able to squeeze the trigger just as the, the swords were about to cross there. And you know, it's not only the fish that benefit from these healthy ecosystems, it's, it's terrestrial animals like birds. This was a frigate bird that I found that you know, was inhabiting one of these remote, uninhabited islands by humans. And these animals have to forage in the coastal waters. And if, if they don't have fish there, they have to go further and further afield to do that. And their chicks and they will suffer because of that. But, but it was the underwater places that really impressed me. You know, it's, it's almost impossible anywhere else in the world that you go diving today on a coral reef to find coral cover, the percentage of coral that's covering the bottom, more than 20%. That's kind of the new baseline. But in these places, it was 85 to 100%. 85 to 100% of the bottom was covered with coral, beautiful gardens. This is how it probably looked everywhere hundreds of years ago, but we've lost it. So the idea is to use these places as a baseline for conservation. And with that, I wanted to close with a story of hope, a story about marine reserves. In my opening comments, I mentioned that 98% of Earth's biosphere, 98% of where animals can live, is ocean. And yet, a fraction of 1% of that is truly protected, truly off limits as no-take marine reserves. So clearly, if we want a healthy ocean, and as a result, a healthy planet, we need to create more marine reserves. It's not unreasonable to expect or ask to protect 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the world's oceans for the future as replenishment zones. So as sort of a solution story to the global fish story that I talked about earlier, which was very depressing to work on, I wanted to do a story about a solution, the solution of marine reserves. And I went to the country of New Zealand, which was a country that was rather progressive and is rather progressive in terms of conservation. And I really wanted this story to just be about a few things. I wanted it to be about abundance, about diversity, but mostly about resilience, to show that the ocean does have the ability to heal itself if we leave it alone. And when I first arrived in New Zealand, I met with this gentleman, the father of marine reserves, a, a scientist named Dr. Bill Ballantyne, who's in his 70s. and. Uh, is a mollusk scientist. On any day when the weather's good, you can still find him on his hands and knees down at a place called Goat Island doing his data set. And it was in 1972 that Ballantyne somehow miraculously convinced the New Zealand government to create this first MPA, Marine Protected Area. I still don't know how he did it because he had to fight commercial fishermen who didn't want a marine reserve. They didn't want any place they couldn't go fishing. He had to fight sport fishermen who used to go there and fish off the rocks with rod and reel. And he even had to fight his fellow scientists because they used to go there to collect specimens. But somehow we got it done. And what he told me was he said, Brian, we expected that certain things would happen if we made this a no-take marine reserve. We expected, for example, that certain species of fish that had been fished to the brink of extinction, like the New Zealand snapper that we see here, would return. And they did. They returned in both size and in number. But then what he said was other things happened that we couldn't predict. For example, the New Zealand snapper predates. It eats sea urchins. We see one with two sea urchins in its mouth right here. Well, sea urchins predate on kelp. When the fish were wiped out, the sea urchins just ran amok. And they ate all the kelp. So all anyone ever saw when they put their head below the surface in the shallow waters of this part of New Zealand, all they ever saw was what they called urchin barrens, acres and acres of sea urchins and no kelp. When the fish came back and controlled the urchin population, lo and behold, you had kelp forests emerging in shallow water. This is how it looked you know, 500 years ago in this part of New Zealand, but nobody is around to tell us. So I think the message is clear. You know, If we create these, these no-take zones, the planet will restore itself to a natural equilibrium, and then we can see how it's supposed to be, and we can, we can do that in other places as well. What I saw was not only the marine life returned, but people returned as well. Ballant, these were two brothers who, whose mom had driven them uh, down from Auckland to come to this place, and, and they had come that day and, and, and driven past much more beautiful beaches, beautiful white sandy beaches, but they came here to Goat Island, this little place, because there was something to see. And Ballantyne told me a very interesting thing. He said that in 1972, when they created this place, all the, uh, uh, th about 3,000 people, at that time of year, 3,000 people would come to Goat Island, and they went there to go fishing. And when they created the MPA, all the newspapers 
in New Zealand had big headlines that said nothing left to do at Goat Island because they figured if you couldn't go fishing off the rocks there, there was nothing left to do. Well, fast forward now 40 years. Not 3,000 people, 300,000 people a year go there. 300,000 people a year come to this place just because there's something to see. We need that connection with nature. It's, it's not difficult. I saw this everywhere that I worked in these reserves in New Zealand. This is an aerial photo I made from a helicopter in the South Island of New Zealand, a place called Fiordland, a very shadowy sort of Lord of the Rings kind of place. This is the Camelot River, a river like so many in that part of the world that, that flow into the sea with fresh tannin-stained water. And the tannin stain from all that vegetable matter creates a permanent layer of fresh water that sits on top of the ocean. It blocks out sunlight. It's a very unique ecosystem. And what happens is you get the emergence of deep water animals, things like black coral, that normally are found in the deep ocean. This is a colony of black coral that actually looks white when it's alive underwater. It looks like a tree, but it's, it's a living animal, coral, that I photographed in only about 30 or 40 feet of water. Other Unique animals like sea pens, a type of coral, again, that are normally found in the deep ocean, but here are tricked into emerging into shallow water. This is a picture in about 70 feet of water made at about noontime, 1 o'clock in the afternoon on a bright sunny day, but looking horizontally, there's no ambient light because of that layer. Very unique. You know, everywhere I looked, the ecosystem seemed healthy. I played peekaboo with New Zealand fur seal pups in the fronds of kelp. And in the North Island, where the water is bluer and a little warmer, I swam with giant stingrays and underwater canyons. And on the benthic level, saw tiny animals like this nudibranch, a, a snail without a shell, crawling over encrusting sponge. Every animal played a vital role, like the leather jacket, a type of trigger fish that grazes on the bottom and creates bare spots so that new life can take hold. I made this photograph on one of my last days there. It, I call it my primal ocean photograph, like the ocean looked a long time ago, because the day before I had tea with an old-time diver, a guy named Wade Doak, who was diving in this place, the Poor Knights Island, in the 1950s and 1960s. And over tea, he told me that he believed that the diving and the marine life was better here today than it was in the 1950s or 1960s. And as I left him that evening and was preparing my equipment to dive the next day, it sort of dawned on me that I couldn't think of another place that I had been in the world where somebody has said that. You know, every place that I go, people say, you should have been here 10 years ago. Should have been here 15 years ago. The corals were better. There were more sharks, more fish. But here was a place that was better today than it was in the 1950s or 60s simply because they protected it. They left it alone in the 1980s. So I think the message is clear and re that nature is resilient and tolerant to a point, but we must act. You know, we must listen, we must see, and we must act. So in closing, we step away and once again see our planet from a distance, knowing that all these things are going on down there in the, in the blue parts and so much more. In the final paragraph of my book, Ocean Soul, I say the following. We are all connected to the sea and tied to her fate. The wounds suffered by Earth's oceans are not fatal. We can still turn the tide of past harm into a groundswell of future protection. Scientists have described what's happening to the heart of the sea. Images reveal her soul. With both as our guides, we can serve as vigilant guardians of the sea, and she will again thrive. I remain hopeful that her siren song will echo loud and clear and continue to seduce men and women of future generations to leave the safety of the water's edge and explore. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.